The main thing I want to draw your attention to is that after this, and when you're doing your medication labs, we're talking about the six rights in relation to Queensland Health. So Tollefson, if anyone has the Spiral Tollefson book, which is your skills book, they have something different. Crisp and Taylor have something different. There's some books with 10 rights. So that's fine, and you can, in reality, use, you know, 100 rights. You'll probably take a long time giving medications. But what we're testing you on and what we're assuming you're going to know, and in OSCEs, if you're giving medications, we want you to know the six rights according to Queensland Health, because that's really what you're going to be doing in practice. So the use of medications. Now, the first time I've done this, and I remember as a student when I did this, now, I'm not teaching you to be pharmacists. So my intention isn't to have a big scientific um, background on this, but it is important to try and put this into context of what you're going to be as a nurse and how you're going to actually act in the clinical world. So some things to think about of the quality use of medications. So whilst a lot of the use of medications is taken out of our hands, it's you know, done by doctors, it's done by pharmacists, it might be part of your role if any of you become nurse practitioners, there are things that we need to think about. So judicious use, appropriate use. So hopefully we're using the drug most appropriate to the patient. I say appropriate use because in my world in kids, the amount of people that come into ED and say, oh, I've just been put on antibiotics, okay, or I've, my child has just been put on antibiotics, what for? Oh, a fever. Mm, no, they wouldn't have been put on anti antibiotics for a fever. They might have been put on something that was causing the fever, but now GPs just tend to give antibiotics out because they've only got 10 minutes to see you and a lot of the times um, patients will expect medications. Well, I've gone in there, I need something to fix this issue. And sometimes, and you've probably seen in the news, that's what's causing a lot of our superbugs like MRSA and BRE because we're inappropriately using medications and as consumers, we are inappropriately expecting medications from our GPs. I would really advise you as you're kind of you're a steward for the nursing profession, talk to your patients about this, about the appropriate use. Talk to your family members that when they go and see the GP, you know, sometimes the best thing is actually nothing and just a bit of rest. You don't need antibiotics all the time. Safe use, now this comes into a little bit more for us because obviously when it comes to administering the medication, we're gonna go through our six rights. I wanna make perfectly clear that just like us, and like I've said, I am very slick at all this nursing stuff, but I do make mistakes, as you will all, and as doctors will as well. I want you to be really clear in the fact that doctors aren't these superhumans that are completely faultless. Your job is to stop doctors killing people. That might be slightly simplified, but you are the very backstop of, you are the one that's gonna hand the medication over. Now, I've seen doctors write up things 10, 20 times the dose of what they should do, because they may have just come from adults in my world, or they may have come from a renal ward where they could use that medication completely different to what you would use in normal life. So please make sure that just because someone's written it up doesn't mean that that is the correct thing. That doesn't mean that is the correct dose. So make sure that you are doing your best to be that backstop of safe use. So the medication team, as I said, you're there. Um, the prescriber, well, we have to kind of put them there, so unfortunately we're going to have to give the doctor their dues here because if they don't write it, we can't give it. Um, the nurse, so you're obviously going to be that backstop of making sure what they write is appropriate for the patient. The pharmacy, now, in hospital, um, it's not that the pharmacist will check everything, but what you will find is the pharmacist will do their rounds, and sometimes you'll see on the medication chart some um, writing in green, which basically means that the pharmacist has come round, they've had a look at the medication chart, and they've been the third checker. They've had a look and gone, right, well, I'm happy with these, and I'm going to sign off in green. You don't have to get them signed off by the pharmacist to give them, because the pharmacist will come round and do a round. You're very, very unlikely to see that in aged care, but because you've got the web store or the blister pack, they've already had the pharmacist see them before they've come to you. The patient and the family, I really, really want to stress the point here that the patient and family are very, very important in the medication team because there's been countless stories that I've been told, especially in aged care. And again, I'm not bagging aged care, but aged care is, is woefully understaffed and nurses, you might have one RN and they're the only person that can give the medications out. And if you have one RN for a whole facility, 
Unfortunately, mistakes are going to be made through, through no one specific fault, but there's going to be mistakes made. So you really need to educate the patient and their family to be that very last person. You need to educate them. If we give you a different medication, ask what it is. So don't be offended if you go to the patient and I say, what's that blue one? Because you should be able to tell me. And if you're giving your medications for the first time, if you feel uncomfortable in answering me, what is that one? What does it do? Is that the right dose? If you can't answer those simple things, then you shouldn't be given that medication. The difficulty here is you can see here in acute care, and I'm talking about hospitals, that standing orders, PRN orders, single orders, stat orders can all appear on the same chart. And it gets really, really confusing. So I'll give you my example from emergency. It could be that a patient comes to see me. I know they're not going to be able to see a doctor for two hours. As a triage nurse, I'm allowed to give my patient Panadol. I'm allowed to write that up as a one dose, and I can give it to them in triage and say, have a seat, the doctor will be out with you. So I would write a single one-time order, because that's what I'm allowed to do. The doctor might come out and say, right, well, they need this done, they need this procedure, uh, I'm going to write a stat order of Panadol to be given in a couple of hours. Okay. And then the doctor says, do you know what, actually, they're going to come in. I'm going to admit them, so I'm going to write up a, a routine Panadol. I'm going to put it in there. They need to have it every six hours. On the back, I'm going to put a PRN order. I'm going to put that, so if they need it at four hours, you can do the PRN order. Can you see how many spots that I need to check for that one medication to make sure that I'm not overdosing my patient on Panadol? So it becomes really, really confusing, and that's why you as a nurse need to be that last person to make sure that you're not doing the wrong thing. Because the doctor's just thinking, well, I'm, I'll put it everywhere, the patient will get Panadol, not thinking this is going to cause confusion to the nurses. So please make sure that you're very aware that one medication could be written up in lots of different places on the same chart. I'm not going to worry about this one because the distribution systems will alter very differently from hospital to hospital. So some places you might want to go on to the computer and say, well, we haven't got that drug on the ward. What ward do they have it in? And you would go and get it yourself. In some private hospitals, you would just call someone up and say, can you get me so-and-so? And they will go and look for it for you. Now, I'm going to stop here very briefly because I said at the very start that I didn't want you to become pharmacists. And I'm not intending you to, uh, to think of this as a pharmacology lecture. What I do want to point out, though, is sometimes we look at these things and go, that really doesn't relate to me. That's a pharmacist's job. I'm not going to worry. But we need to put things into context of us as nurses. So pharmacokinetics, so the movement of drugs, why do I need to know that as a nurse? Can anyone give me an example of that? What's, what's the value of me knowing that as a nurse? My example of this one is very, very simple. Now, if I know that, unlike Panadol, Nurofen dissolves in the stomach, what would I advise my patient? Things like this are important to know, because then I can, say, then I can give practical advice to my, my patient. I'm not about knowing stuff just for the sake of knowing stuff. So pharmacodynamics, clearly I've not discussed that one in a tea room either. Can anyone give me an example of why maybe as a nurse, from a practical point of view, um, I might want to know that. So when we talk about the, the physiological effects, so we're also talking about how it does its thing in the body. So not just about kind of what you see on the outside. So I'm not talking, oh, I give morphine, that person becomes sleepy. Um, why would I need to know, well, what does it actually do in the body? Can anyone give me an example of that one? If I know, for example, that I'm given morphine for pain, but I know that it also reduces my respiratory center, then that's probably an important thing to know, because then I need to know that I need to keep an eye on their breathing. A lot of us will think, well, isn't that the doctor's job? And you might be right, because they're the one charting these. But sometimes, I've been involved in many that the doctor comes, they write all these things down, and it's not until the doctor leaves that the, the patient says, oh, I forgot to say, I'm actually on this, and I'm actually on this. Oh, and before I forget, I've also been diagnosed with this. And I'm like, well, you couldn't have remembered this five minutes ago. So you need to make the choice, well, that medication is a stat dose, and I need to give it now. Is that something that I should give? Is that something I should get the doctor in for? So again, I'm not after scientific things, but from a practical level, how do these affect me? The one example that I'm going to give on this one 
not that it's too much of an issue now because they ban codeine in, in pharmacy, but I know that codeine is metabolized by a certain enzyme, P450, to be correct. Please don't remember that. It's not going to be in your exam. So codeine is, is metabolized by this enzyme into morphine. Now, that's great because then I know, well, it's not as strong as morphine because it's kind of like a dilute body version of morphine. But what I do know is that 8% of the population don't have this enzyme to convert codeine. So I know that if, because again, back in the day when I was in triage, we could give pain stop, which was um, Panadol and a bit of codeine for kids in moderate pain. But I know that because 8% of, of patients don't convert into morphine, that if my patient comes up to me in an hour and goes, I'm still in lots of pain, I can probably then go, well, you're not lying. Maybe you're just the unlucky 8%. So then I can talk to the doctor and say, I've given this. Do you have any ideas? So just knowing some things about medications is going to really help you as a nurse from a practical level. So the top one here, who can tell me? So when we're talking about names, what three types of names might you come into contact with in regards to medications? So we've got brand name and generic name. So the chemical name, you're unlikely to come across that. However, um, the, one, the one chemical name that has started to become a little bit more commonplace is epinephrine. So epinephrine, especially in EDs, or EpiPen, hopefully that's going to give away what it is. So it used to just be adrenaline that you'd have on the crash cart, and for whatever reason, we became American, and we decided to call it epinephrine. So classification of drugs, can anyone tell me what, what kind of classifications they are aware of? So NSAID, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Again, as a nurse, why is it important to know various classifications of drugs? So I'm probably not going to want to give Nurofen and Voltaren. So again, doctors sometimes, you might have lots of diff different doctors coming in writing on this chart. And sometimes they're not very good in going, let's have a look at what else is written. Or I think this is a much better NSAID. This is much better for inflammation, so I'm going to write this down. And they forget to cross off the Nurofen. And if we didn't check, and I didn't know they were the same classifications, I'm going to merrily give them to my patient, and I've overdosed my patient, causing I don't know what. Medication legislation. Again, I'm not, after you, I'm not expecting you to be policymakers within the hospital, but it is a good idea because you as a nurse, if anything ever went wrong, they're going to say, well, that's in the Therapeutic Goods Act. And you're, you, you stand in the front of court going, oh, I don't know what that is, is not going to cut it. Now, if you ever think, well, do I have to read the whole document? You can always find the cheat sheet online. You can always find a summary, a one-page summary. What does this mean for me? So again, I'm not going to be, I'm going to be explicitly saying, I'm not going to be asking for your opinion on the Therapeutic Goods Act or other medication uh, legislation in your exam. But for being an RN, that might be something good to just briefly know about, very briefly, briefly. Now, we've kind of covered these things when we were talking about, you know, neurofen being absorbed in the stomach and therefore it doesn't have that much effect on the liver. Again, I've never sat around the tea room talking about all these different kind of things, but I would say have a brief understanding. So types of action, so therapeutic effects, so that's what we're actually giving the medication for, and hopefully, depending on what we're giving it for, we're going to be able to record that therapeutic effect. So if it was analgesia, Hopefully, we're going to do um, a pain score beforehand. Then we're going to give Panadol or whatever we're going to give. And I'm going to go back and I'm going to find out, hopefully, that the pain score is decreased and it had a therapeutic effect for the patient. A side effect is un unintended. So we mentioned over here, such as morphine. So morphine, I know if I give morphine and I'm giving it for someone in a lot of pain, um, I know that there is other side effects, such as respiratory depression. So unfortunately, I might have to um, put them on a monitor. I might have to check their SATs. I might put their bed nearer the nurse's station. So adverse effects. A lot of the times when we go through our medication chart, it says on the top in the corner, any adverse reactions. Now, for me, in a hospital, I really only want to know about anaphylaxis. OK, cool. We're not going to have penicillin. If you said to me, oh, well, I had penicillin and I got a bit itchy, now, I might put that there, but again, we go back to educating the patient and saying, well, a lot of these drugs do cause things like that. And medication interactions. So I know for a fact that sometimes if um, uh, some medications are avoided because of certain interactions. So how I said about um, codeine, apparently fluoxetine, which is a SSRI, if anyone wants to look that one up, if you have that, 
that will negate the properties of, of um, codeine metabolizing into morphine. Um, but some medications are given because they increase the interaction. So, for example, um, if you have a new DKA patient, so diabetic ketoacidosis, sometimes if they're new and they're put on insulin, sometimes they're also given uh, infusions of potassium as well because it helps the insulin. And so sometimes uh, medication interactions actually work in our favor, so we actually uh, take advantage of them. Some medications through IV, especially when you're hanging them up on the line, sometimes you have to flush them in. Sometimes certain medications you need to give and then let an hour go by before you put them in. Because if you put them up too close to each other, you might actually crystallize the line. And the last thing you want is, is crystals of whatever going into a patient's vein. So sometimes you need to be really careful, especially with IVs. Um, the one thing I'm going to mention here is the plateau. And the reason being is we're going to look at this one. And my example of this is a hangover. Now, I'm in no way assuming, just by how you look, that you're all uh, horrible drunks. That's not what I'm saying. I am playing the stats and saying you're all students and you're all student nurses, and we tend to have a reputation of being good drinkers. Now, you've got a whole weekend that you get to celebrate. You finish your placement on the Friday, you have that whole weekend to yourself, and then you become second year. So that's the weekend that you're going to party. Now, we wake up with a hangover, and what we tend to do is we rush to get the Panadol, and we take a Panadol, and hopefully it has some effect. And we see that we've taken it, it gets up to a therapeutic range, and we think, oh my god, I finally feel better. OK, good, I'm going to go back to bed, or I'm going to watch Netflix. The trouble is, what we do is we just take it when we've got the headache and we forget about it, and we don't stick to four or six hourly, and then we come crashing down, and we have for the whole day this kind of waves of feeling really bad and really good and really bad. If we actually, and this is the reason that we need to stick to medication regimes, is if we woke up with a cracking hangover, I'm going to take Panadol, and then it's going to come down, and then in four hours I'm going to take another one, so I'm always trying to keep it in that therapeutic range. So that's a real basic example of using Panadol. So what I would say is on that weekend, if there's two of you partying together, if one of you wants to use the four to six hourly and the other one does the normal thing, you can come back to me and you can tell me all about your research. But our, our job as a nurse, and this is why sometimes we, especially if it's just Panadol, for example, on a patient's chart, we think, look, I can't get to them this hour. I'm going to have to wait till next hour because I'm, I'm busy showering someone. The problem is for our patient, and I'm just using Panadol as a really simple example, the problem is I'm going to kind of come and have these peaks and troughs into the therapeutic um, nature of what I'm taking. So your job as a nurse is always to try and make sure that I'm staying in a therapeutic range for as much as possible. Likewise, please don't be thinking, oh, well, it says four hours, but it's three hours, and if I give them the Panadol now, then they'll be fine. Because if I keep doing three hours every day, I'm going to slowly get up into there and then up into there, and I'm going to have this co toxic concentration that's going to obviously cause unwanted effects from my patient. So types of medication action. So this top one here is urticaria. Um, how would we normally kind of describe that? if we were at home and we were describing it to a person. So we might say it kind of looks a bit welty, like a welt-like rash. And you can see here that it's quite defined. It looks like a bit of an island. You've got this lovely white bit in here and these pink bit around the side. If you get someone that comes in with urticaria, you might want to draw around that. So if they come to you for the first time, because it might, be, it might not be a medication. Maybe they just come from home and they've just come up with this. And it could be from anything or oh, we've just used a new laundry powder, or first time that he's had peanuts. I would draw around that just to see if it gets any bigger. Is urticaria anything to overly worry about? Definitely if it gets worse, I'm probably going to have to look at it. But from, from the initial outset, so they've just come, they've just stood in front of me, it's your best friend, they've said, look at my rash. Am I going to worry about it right in front of me? If it was just my arm, I'd say, oh, thank you. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Let me draw on you, and let's keep an eye on it. If, however, I turn up and said, oh, look, I've got urticaria all over my neck, that would be something that I need to be like, I need to go to ED. Because any rash, anything on the neck, I don't know what underlying structures that's also affecting. And obviously, um, if that is going to start, if I've got urticaria in my airway, that's going to be something that I need to jump on quite quickly. But this one, it's not a very good picture, but this one is a, a very simple um, vesicle rash. 
So what would I need to do to that rash to know if that was a really worrying rash? I'm going to palpate, so I'm going to touch it, and if the blood doesn't rush back straight away, so what are we calling that? So that one, I would press down. So again, if you press down on your skin now, it goes white. If I had a petechial rash, that wouldn't do anything. Those little spots wouldn't go anywhere. Sometimes a petechial rash will look like this, little fine dots. Sometimes they will look a bit like little tiny bruises. And once those bruises start forming, that's when you really, really need to start worrying. I'm not going to say panic, but I've seen, thankfully only once, from a petechial rash to a whole leg being purple, and they had to have it amputated. Because it was basically the blood was just pouring out of their circulatory system into, and there was just no hope for the leg, not them, they were fine afterwards. Pruritus, itching of the skin, and rhinitis, exactly like hay fever. So you would get a bit swollen, you'd get red eyes, you'd start discharging all over the place, just from your head. I mean, anywhere else, that's a different, that's something completely different. I'm going to pause on this slide because these are the six rights. Whether they're in your exam or not, these are the six rights that you need to know because these are Queensland Health um, six rights. So I'm just going to pause and let you absorb, take it all in. So we're going to look at these a little bit more. So right patient. So obviously this is where we're going to involve our patient first. We're going to say, hey, uh, what's your name? That was always a good start. I'm going to check that IV band. Um, I'm also going to look, because what you might see is on their, on their um, prescription chart, I've got a box that says this is what I'm allergic to, but a lot of patients will have a red band as well. It used to be that the red band would actually have their allergy on it, but now the red band is just a plain red band, and it's just to alert you, please look at the medication chart. What happens if, um, if the patient is unconscious? Is it just the band that we're going off? If you don't know, and if you are uncomfortable, always go back to the patient. If there's family members there, not that that's going to be your final check. Never rely on the family member. But as your first check, check with them, and then I would go back to my ID band and the medication chart. Now, I'm fully aware that we've skipped over the right drug because you were so intent on writing those six down, you were all about to shout at me, what about the right drug? Thanks. But obviously, I can't really show you how to check the right drug because that's what you're going to be doing in your lab. So it's not that I don't care about the right drug, but that's going to be for lab time. So the right dose. So I'm going to go through my formula, and I'm going to check that with someone else and make sure that what is written, I'm going to check that that's right. I'm going to have a look in the MIMS, and I'm going to say, OK, well, that's what the doctor's written. Is that actually the right dose for the patient? And it might be, when you look in the MIMS, the right dose might be very different depending on what you're treating. So I'll go back to codeine. So codeine can be given for moderate pain. Codeine can also be given for coughs. Because some weird thing, the side effect of codeine is it knocks off the part of your brain um, that wants you to cough. But the dosage is very different. Obviously, I don't want to give a pain medication for someone that's just got a little tickle in their throat. So I need to check the MIMS and make sure that it's appropriate to them. If there is multiple dosing units, so if there are more than five tablets, I need to be thinking, is there a different tablet somewhere in the hospital? So for example, prednisolone. Does anyone know what prednisolone is? Has anyone had it before? So prednisone or prednisolone is uh, normally given for patients with asthma or other respiratory illnesses. Um, and it comes in one milligram tablets, five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 25 milligrams, and it's based on one mil per kilo. Now I, as we've already discussed, am a huskier gentleman. If you were giving me the one milligram tablets, I would be eating more than 100 of those. So clearly I might think, I'm not going to give you the exact number, because then you'd be like, what a fatty. But I'm going to be eating more than 100 of those. I probably maybe need to get me some 25 milligrams. So as well as the right dose, make sure that the dose of the medication you're giving is appropriate to the patient so I'm not forced shoveling in tablets after tablets. So the right route, I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Um, again, medications can be given in lots of different routes. They can also, as you said, they can be um, slow-release tablets as well. So am I given the right drug, um, even though they're both oral? Is that the right one? 
am I giving it the right route? I'm very sorry, I'm going back to Panadol, but Panadol comes in IV form. Is it a tablet? Is it a liquid? Am I giving a suppository Panadol? Is it IV Panadol? Um, I need to make sure how I'm giving it. If it's oral, am I giving it via NG? Am I giving it in the mouth? So make sure that you're very aware. One medication, lots of different ways to give it. And you can involve your patient in giving their own suppositories. Obviously, make sure you educate them first. So the right time. Now, this is a little bit of bugbear for a lot of nurses because it's the doctor's role to write down the drug and write, write down the actual times, not just to go TDS. Whilst that might be correct, the doctor's job is to also write down the exact times that they want them given. You'll see a lot of nurses, the patient will come up from ED and they'll have a whinge about the doctor and they will just write the times in. Now, I know that that happens, I've done it myself, but the doctor is the one who should be writing those times. And again, make sure that you're looking at PRN and stat doses as well, because it might be 8 o'clock and it might be that's when it's due, but they may have just had a stat dose at 7 o'clock in ED, so make sure you look at those things. So the right to refuse, this is a double whammy. Any patient has the right to say, I don't want that. Now, if I said, no, I don't want to take my Viagra today, I don't know why I picked that one, but if that's what I said, I couldn't think, why couldn't I just go back to Panadol? I've said, I don't want my Viagra today. Are you just going to go, okay, cool, refused. So then I'll try a bit of education, see why they don't want to take it. It might be the, the, the tablet's so big, I, it's really difficult to swallow. Okay, well, I'll talk to the pharmacy and I'll see if there's a different way we can give it. I'll see if I can crush it. So, but without the education, I don't know those things. But likewise, you as a nurse have a right to refuse to give the medication as well. I want to make it very clear, that's not just because oh, I don't like you and I don't want to see you after you've taken Viagra. That is, that is the wrong dose. I don't want to give that because that's wrong then you will go through, you will talk, call the doctor. So the, your right to refuse is if there is a safety concern. That's the wrong dose, that's the wrong time, they've just had a stat, I need to call the doctor. So you and the patient have a right to refuse. So documentation, you'll find that on a lot, so I know that there's a 10 steps to medication. One of them is documentation. Not within Queensland Health, but still very important. It's important that you put everything on the chart. The only thing I'm going to mention here is that it's very common that you or I will check the drug and we'll come up with everything, we've done everything beautifully, and we'll sign for it and then go to the patient. Normally, nine times out of ten, that's fine because the patient will take the drug and it's fine, we can go on to our next thing. But what happens if we go, right, so let's check this insulin. You're happy, I'm happy, let's sign for it now. We walk out of the door and there's a big arrest and we run off and we're in the thick of it and there's, one, there's always one nurse left to look after all the other beds. And the patient says, oh, nurse, I'm due my insulin now. And they look at the medication chart and say, no, 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 it's already signed for, I can't give that one. So you should only be signing for things after a patient has taken it. The same as with kids. I will only sign for it a couple of minutes after they've taken it because you can be guaranteed as soon as I sign for it, and they vomit everything up. And if they vomit straight away, you're allowed to give it straight away. Um, but I will kind of wait. I, kind of, I won't look at them and stay there for a minute, but I'll keep an eye on them, and then I'll sign it afterwards. I'm not saying when you need to, but please don't sign in the drug room. Make sure your patient's taken it. There's been lots of stories in mental health where patients have taken it and gone, yep, 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 thanks very much, and they've stored them, and they've got like 50 or 100 because they want to commit suicide later on with the drugs that they should have been having for the last month. So please make sure that your patient's taking it before you sign. The only thing I'm going to mention here, just because I had lots of people looking at me very kind of flatly when I asked, this route here is not through the GI tract. Remember when we talked about feeding? This one is also medications because as you can see here, I'm completely avoiding the GI tract. So parenteral route is not just for feeding. And if you can remember all the way back, because I know we've been going for weeks on this, there was a picture of someone with a Hickman line. Now, that's not just for feeding, that's also for giving medications, and you might use um, these medications um, as a parental route, because they can go through Hickman's, Portacath, Picks. Intraosseous, does anyone know what th that one is? Um, so intraosseous guns, it used to be like a corkscrew, and you used to find, if you have a feel just below your knee, there's a flat part right there. 
and it used to be that's where you would corkscrew this really thick needle in and it will go into the bone marrow and you can draw blood back, you can put fluid in um, because if someone has crashed, they're peripherally shut down, it's really difficult to get access. So after three goes, let's just put a needle in them. They've come up with drills now that look like a little kind of handyman's drill that you can and it's done. But intraosseous might be a common one if you're involved in an emergency on your ward. So oral medication obviously is the most common that we're always going to come across. This is generally preferred by the patients, mainly because obviously they can take it home with a little kind of education for the patient. Um, and we can give lots of different things, so tablets, capsules, liquids. It does have a longer onset for your action because obviously it's got to go through a lot of things. It's got to go through uh, my GI tract to be absorbed into the blood. For you in aged care, you're going to have lots of patients with different... Um, uh, issues with their ability to swallow. So please make sure that before you're giving medications for the first time, as well as going through the MIMS, go through the patient notes and see if they've got any dysphagia or anything like that, or anything that is going to um, be an issue for them taking oral. Because the last thing you want to do, especially in aged care where you don't have all those emergency people around, is um, make them aspirate and cough and they put something into their lungs. So please make sure that you're checking everything before you give the medication. Now, I'm going to flip between the two. So I've got sublingual and buccal. Now, as I've said, this is the fourth year of teaching, and I finally thought, right, I'm going to ask Matt, and I'm going to ask Peter Ann, who did your infection control. Matt, who you've not met, he's the science guy. And I thought, if anyone's going to know, it's going to be these two people. I said, realistically, both of these are being absorbed by the mucous membranes. So what is the real difference of giving one over the other? And we couldn't think of anything. The only thing we can possibly think of is that you've got more veins under your tongue. So we're thinking there might be a slightly quicker absorption than, than if you put it um, buckle. The only other reason we came up with buckle is if you're giving maybe like a lozenge or something that's a little bit bigger, it might be more comfortable to put onto the side of the mouth and under your tongue. That was the only thing we can think of. So with these, it's important that you let them dissolve. They don't swallow. These are designed to be um, gone straight into the blood system and avoid the GI tract. So please make sure they stay in there until everything is dissolved and you don't give them um, drink or fluid. It says until it's dissolved, but I would probably wait for about 10 or 15 minutes afterwards before they have anything. So topical administration. I've not ever seen anyone paint medication on someone, but that's what the book says, so we'll go with that one. The one thing that a lot of people ask is... Do I wear gloves or not? Now, that's completely up to you. It's completely up to the thing that you're painting, and it also depends on what the underlying condition is. For eczema, for example, and aqueous cream, even though that's not a great cream, I can't think of anything else, that might be something for the patient's comfort that I don't wear gloves. But that is up to me to decide. They're not an infection risk to me because my skin is intact, I'm okay. If I wear gloves, that's fine. It just might be a little bit uncomfortable as you're smearing all this cream because a lot of the time in hospitals, if they're coming with eczema, it's, the, it's florid eczema. It's all over the place. So I'm going to try and kind of be a little bit nicer to them. But if you choose to wear gloves, that's fine. If, however, my aqueous cream is just like a kind of a moisturiser cream, if it was an actual medication, then I would be wearing gloves because the last thing I want to do is get the medication effects and possible side effects without thinking of it. A one-off might be okay, but if I'm doing that, you know, 20 times a day for years, um, what happens when I need that, that cream? So like um, hydrocortisone or something like that, it's not going to work. And hydrocortisone after a long time will make your, your skin quite thin. Mucous membranes. Before I'm not going to read that one, but have a look at the pictures. Does that look like a, an appropriate way to administer eye drops? I think that's a little bit cruel. It looks like I'm going to jabber in the eye. The other thing is, you never drop things unless you're irrigating the eye. I'll make it very clear. We're not dropping it bang onto their eye. That's going to be quite painful. When you're giving eye drops, firstly, you don't want your patient laid flat. You kind of want them at 30 degrees. You pull down, so you form a little pouch in your eyelid, and that's where you put the drops, because then when they blink, it disperses all of the drops over their eye. Putting something on someone's eye is going to be quite sore. So please don't go straight for the eyeball. The ear canal is not a straight line. Because if it was a straight line, anything that went in would hit my eardrum, and that's going to be quite painful. 
but it changes its course on how old you are. So when you're doing a tympanic, you need to know, am I pulling the ear down and back, or it's up and sideways? The same with um, this as well. Just by dropping it in is not really going to do its job. It might eventually get to the place I need it, but it would probably be a lot easier if I pulled the ear in the correct direction. So please have a look. How do I pull the ear? Um, inhalation medications, the one that I don't have here, obviously these are the common ones that you're going to think about. So your Ventolin, your um, Fluoxetide. These are probably going to be the common ones, even though Ventolin's not up there because it's blue. The one that I haven't put up there is the inhalation medications that you might have via oxygen. So you might have adrenaline, for example, that is put in a little acorn that sits under your mask. And it, with, the, with the oxygen, it will kind of vaporize and you'll breathe it in. So that's another good one. And they do absorb really quickly. Another one that is quite common, especially in acute care settings, when you come in, let's pretend you've had a nice dinner fork fracture. Does anyone know what a dinner fork fracture looks like? It literally looks like the side of a fork. So if you held your arm up, it will come up here and then out and then up again. It's the kind of fracture that you look at and going, now you don't need an x-ray because I think I know what's happened there. Now, can you imagine you've come in, you're already a little bit anxious, you're really upset, and then the first thing I do is go and jab a needle in you. You're going to be like, oh, well, this is great, isn't it? I've just done this, and now you're getting this arm. So what you sometimes will see, a little bit like that boy there, is rather than in a medication, you might get, say, midazolam, um, which is, uh, has some sedative properties. You'll get some in a syringe, and you'll put a little atomizer on the top and you can squeeze that up and it turns it into a fine mist that you snort and then it kind of sedates the patient a little bit enough that they're a little bit more comfortable so you can put a cannula in. So that other kind of inhalation because you are breathing them in. So injections, I'm not going to go too much on this one. For anyone that's got their handouts for the lecture, the last few slides I was wondering how I was going to take them out and they're based on the IM injections. The reason being is this course, and for your aged care, you are not to give intramuscular injections. The reason I've kept them in there is because you are going to be learning how to give subcutaneous injections. And I think it's important that you know what the difference is. So in practice, when you see someone give one, you can go, oh, I know what that is. So next time when they say, do you want to have a go, you can say, no, I can't because that's an IM but I can do the subcut. So I put them in there just for your information, but you cannot give IMs within 1809. There are going to be lots of needles, just like there are lots of cannula sizes that you're going to need. So for example, if I have a mental health patient who is on certain medications, they're quite thick. If I've got someone kicking off, I can't go through, because you might find a, a, a mental health patient, you've got four people pinning this poor person down, I'm not going to be able to daintily say, I'm just going to remove your trousers because I need to find your thigh muscle. I'm going to have to go through the jeans into their muscle, and I'm going to need something a bit chunkier to do that with. Clearly, I'm not going to use that needle, giving an IM injection to a six-month-old. So just like your cannula sizes, I'm going to pick this based on what is the medication, how viscous is the medication, how much medication. If I've got, say, five mils of medication to give, I'm not going to give it through that. I'm going to need something a bit chunkier. But how old is the patient as well? So please be careful when you're giving medications. Try and make sure that you're picking. No one's going to tell you what needle to pick. You need to pick the right needle for your patient. You also need to pick the, the right syringe. This one is going to be the most common one, the lure lock one, because once you put the needle on, it's nice and secure. The downside is sometimes if you put it on too securely, you can't get the bloody thing off to put the needle into uh, the sharps container. Pre-filled syringes, you don't see many of them. The only time I've really come into contact with them is on crash charts, you might have pre-filled epinephrine. You also might have pre-filled vaccinations. They're the really only ones that I come in contact with. You might find lots of other things. I'm not sure if maybe heparin or something comes in a pre-filled one, but you might come across those. Um, I'm not going to go through this at the moment because you're going to get to practice this. If you're not quite sure, have a look at your, your handouts before you do your lab um, because I think most of this, I think it's much better that you get to practice. The one thing I'm going to stop on is it used to always be that IMs were always given at 90 and subcuts were always given at 45. But like I said, if I'm picking the needle based on my patient, I can pick a, a slightly shorter needle and give a subcut at 90. 
Because obviously, if I'm giving something at 90 degrees, it's a much easier process. It's much easier to pierce them like a dart if I'm doing it at 90 than going sideways. I would also say, when you're giving these, actually not throw them, but give it like a dart. It's a quick motion and you're piercing the skin. Don't chicken out, especially on your first go. Don't be like, oh, I'm going to be really slow because, you know, I don't want to hurt the patient. You're going to hurt them a hell of a lot more by slowly feeding this needle all the way into their skin. Just quickly in, give it, and leave them. So this is something that you're going to have to get really confident or at least pretend to be confident when you're doing it for the first time. And whatever you do, don't tell your patient, oh, this is my first time, because it's not going to make them, they're going to tense up and they're going to feel a lot more pain because their muscles are going to be so tight. So clinical calculations. So I am going to get you to, um, on your own, have a go at them. There's only four of them. I am, however, going to be very clear there is calculations in your exam. So some of the things that we're going to look at is, we're not really going to look at conversions too much, although I'm going to mention it, but calculations, pediatric dosage, obviously, I'm always going to go back to peds, and I apologize for anyone that is bored with peds, but I would also say the only other time that we've used pediatric dosaging is in when I've looked after patients with, um, well, very frail, quite small, petite, older ladies, because obviously I don't want to give them a full adult dose, and for people with anorexia that we haven't wanted to give them a complete adult dose because um, we need to kind of use on, on a weight basis. So the formulas, the two main formulas that we're going to use are tablets. So what I need is I need to know what the strength required is, divided by the strength in stock, and that gives me how many tablets I'm going to administer. A really easy way, if, um, if you're thinking, well, was it stock first or required? So SR, so sunrise over sunset, SS. Strength required, so what am I being asked? What is on my medication chart? And I'm going to divide that with what I've got in my drug room. And that's going to give me how many tablets. The only difference with solutions is I'm going to do the exact same thing. So sunrise over sunset times by volume. So how much was it in? So based on that, go for your lives. You will see lots of nurses work things out in their head and they will work. The reason that we use formulas is because Medications, most medications, are double-checked. Now, a double-check is not, I go through everything, I look at the MIMS and I do everything, and then I say, oh, can you just check that's 100 Panadol? And you go, yeah. That's not a double-check. A double-check is, I do everything, I look at the MIMS, what are the side effects, what is the dose, is that correct? I work out the, the tablets, and then I say, hey, can you work this out for me? And I let you. And then we say, right, what did you get? I got this, I got that, okay, I can give the medication. The reason that we do formulas, because if we came up with something different, and we're like, well, how did you come up with 150 tablets when I only came up with four? We can work it out next to each other using the same formula, and we know where one of us went wrong. If we're both using different formulas, it becomes really difficult to be able to compare and know who was correct. So for this one, so strength required was 50 milligrams, divided by 25 gives me two tablets. So first, what we need to do is we can't work with things when they're in different um, formats. We need to convert. Well, we could do it either way, but it, I think it's easy, always easier to work with bigger numbers. We need to change the milligrams into micrograms. So how many micrograms is in a milligram? I'll give you a clue. When you're converting, it's normally always 1,000. I'm going to say normally. I'm not going to say that's a golden rule, but it's normally always 1,000. So to do that, I'm going to move three decimal points because there's three zeros in 1,000. So I get 500 micrograms. And that makes my calculations much easier. So I can, strength required was 500 micrograms. The strength in stock was 250, and I get two tablets. So make sure that you always, and this is a little bit more common when it comes to IVs, especially if you're giving, um, you're not giving a whole bag of something. Sometimes you might have to convert things. So please make sure uh, that you convert beforehand. And again, we're writing tablets underneath. So strength required is 500, divided by 125 is 4. It's in 5 mils, so I need to times by 5, so it's 20 mils. All right, for the last one. So 
So 75 divided by 15 is 5 times 2 is 10.